All right. Uh, good evening to everyone and thank you for coming. On behalf of UCR's College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second lecture in the 2016 Science Lecture Series entitled Sustainability in a Time of Rapid Change, the Future of Earth, Life and Humanity, which is a fairly serious topic. I'm Peter Atkinson. I'm the Divisional Dean of Life Sciences uh, for the college. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the CNAS Science Ambassadors who are serving as ushers tonight. Uh, they are in the blue polo shirts, and so you saw them as you came in, and they're waving furiously at the back at the moment. Uh, they are some of our top undergraduate students who assist the college in many ways at many of these types of events and others throughout the year including community outreach activities and, as I said, um, activities such as this. The title of tonight's talk is Canaries in a Coal Mine, Why Pollinators Are Sensitive to Global Change and How You Can Help Them by Assistant Professor Hollis Woodard. Dr. Woodard is an assistant professor in our world-leading entomology department here at Riverside. She received her PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2012 and was a USDA NIFA postdoctoral fellow from 2013 to 2015. Her research uses genomic and other molecular approaches to study the ecology, evolution and conservation of bumblebees with a focus on nutrition, behavior and health. And I'll say that even at this early stage in her career, uh, Dr. Woodard has already been first author on a publication of our National Academy of Sciences and also has been first author on a publication from the Royal Society, Royal Society of the United Kingdom, which is a, a fantastic achievement. As you saw from the board at the back, uh, Dr. Woodard is one of the class of our new 30 faculty who were recruited into the college this year. So please join with me in welcoming Dr. Holland, Dr. Woodard to the podium. Thank you. I'll do a little mic adjustment first. <laughs> perfect. And can you can you dim the lights a little bit more too? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Well, I want to start off by saying it's so nice to see so many people here tonight. It's great to see so much interest in pollinators and pollinator conservation. It's also an honor to be asked to give a talk in this lecture series. Um, as Peter mentioned, I'm new here. I got here in July, and I've spent this entire time getting my lab and my research program all set up. Um, but I am really have been looking forward to starting to get out in the community and start talking with you guys more about my research and pollinator conservation. And so getting the invitation to give one of these talks is really uh, sort of a nice jumping off point for having that level of community involvement that I'm really excited about. So uh, the other talks in this series are going to be asking you to think at the really big picture, so the global scale. And when it comes to global change, of course, that's the level that we need to be thinking at. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be asking you instead to focus in on a smaller, uh, more fine scale level. So not even at the level of a specific region or even a meadow, um, like this meadow in the Sierras. But I'm going to ask you to zoom all the way in and think about the little tiny critters. And those are the pollinators that provide the service, pollination, that is uh, so important for the health of our planet and for our own way of life. And so I'm going to be zooming in and talking about these little guys um, tonight, telling you a little bit about them. Uh, so typically when uh, you hear a talk about wildlife or biodiversity conservation, the large mammals tend to get a lot of attention. And there's a reason for that. They're really big and fuzzy and cute. And they are ecologically important, too. But I would make two arguments. One is that pollinators collectively provide the service that is so incredibly important. But also, if you're interested in something that's fuzzy and cute and charismatic, if you just zoom in a little bit more and look at bees, they actually fit that bill as well. And so. Um, if you take a bee and look at, at it under a microscope, I think you'll find that they are super fuzzy and cute, too, in addition to being incredibly important. Um, so a good starting off point for tonight is to talk a little bit about what pollination actually is, to make sure we're all on the same page about that. 
So I'm going to talk first about uh, pollination and define it and tell you about why it's important. So pollination is defined as the movement of pollen grains from male flower parts to female uh, flower parts. And some plants um, achieve pollination, this important part of the reproductive cycle of many plants. Um, they achieve this through self-pollination. And in those instances, pollen doesn't have to move very far, obviously. Some plants um, instead rely more on wind pollination. So they're relying on this sort of passive, um, uh, unpredictable force to, to move their pollen around. But then uh, a large number of flowering plants instead rely on animals to help them move their plant their pollen around. And these are uh, this this force uh, that, that occurs is called cross pollination. And I'm going to give you uh, two reasons why cross pollination is really important. Uh, the first uh, is from the sort of population health standpoint. And uh, there's a general trend in biology uh, that uh, it is a good thing to move genes around the landscape and mix them up and spread them around. This is a sort of general trend across lots of different organisms. And for plant populations, flowering plant populations, in many cases we find that that is true as well. And so these pollinators help provide the service of shuttling genes around the landscape. And pollen grains, you can think of them as little units of uh, genes that come from the parent plant. And so. Um, so pollinators help move uh, plant genes around the landscape. And then from a human food production standpoint, there's another reason why cross-pollination is a really good thing. And that's that many um, fruits, when they're cross-pollinated, they are of a higher quality. And so the strawberry on the left that says OP, this is an open pollinated strawberry. This is a plant that was uh, sort of open, exposed to the elements, and uh, pollinators could come to it and move pollen around. The fruit in the middle uh, was self-pollinated, and then the fruit on the right um, was pollinated through either wind or self-pollination. And it should be immediately obvious to you that the fruit on the left is a superior fruit. And so this is just the, the product of one strawberry, but you can imagine around the world, um, because lots of uh, fruits actually need cross-pollination um, to, to produce a su successful fruit like this, you can imagine how you could scale this up and how that would ultimately be a huge part of human food production and security. Uh, here's another example. Blueberries, another um, food crop that relies heavily on cross-pollination. So the plant um, on the left was um, bagged so that pollinators couldn't um, have access to it. And the plant on the right um, is, uh, uh, was open so that pollinators could get to it. And some of those fruits haven't fully developed. But it gives you a good idea of how um, in blueberries, well, to, to produce a successful quality fruit, um, you need that cross-pollination. And these are just two examples, but there are a lot of um, crop plants like this. So who are the pollinators? Who are the little critters that I referred to earlier that perform this really important um, service? I'm going to highlight some of the main groups of pollinators. Um, and I'm going to start specifically by talking a lot about bees. And there are two reasons for that. One is that they're the group that I work on, <laughs> so I like talking about them. But they also actually do provide the majority of pollination service around, services around the world. So bees are a good group of pollinators to focus on. This is a bumblebee. That's the group that I work on. Um, but around the world, there are, we think, more than 20,000 different species of bee. Here in the U.S., there are more than 4,000. So there is incredible diversity among bees. Um, they behave differently. Some, like honeybees, for example, live in social groups. Other bees um, live on their own. In fact, the majority of bees are solitary. They come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and colors. There are rainbow-colored bees. I mean, they're, they are incredibly diverse. And to understand why bees are such good pollinators, um, have to go back in time a little bit. Um, we think that flowering plants arose about 250 million years ago. Um, and the early version of flowering plants maybe possibly looks something like this. This is just a guess. And these early plants, um, they were either self or wind pollinated. But then at some point, um, a wasp-like creature that also maybe looked something like this, again a guess, um, started visiting these flowers and started getting some food re rewards from them. And these food rewards were pollen and nectar. Um, and through time, uh, over the last 250 million years, this relationship between these insects that visit these flowering plants for food and resources, um, and in exchange for that, move uh, pollen around the landscape, these bees diversified and became better and better uh, at what they do as pollinators. And so this mutualist, mutualistic relationship has shaped the evolution of bees, flowers, and, and other pollinators through time. 
So um, through time, flowering plants in, in some lineages, they become incredibly showy and attractive to pollinators. So um, a lot of the bright colors that flowers have, the floral uh, cues that they give off, are uh, attractive to pollinators. And they also, uh, food rewards, the, the food re rewards that these flowering plants provide have become more and more nutritious. So this has been a major driver of plant evolution through their history in, in the lineages that depend on pollinators. Um, and then on the, the bee side, bees have developed um, adaptations that make them really superior pollinators. And so here's a bee that's completely coated in pollen. And the, the fuzzy cuteness of bees in part serves a function, and that's that pollen grains tend to stick to them. So when they fly around and visit different flowers, they tend to be more likely to move pollen around um, between different plants. And so that fuzziness um, serves a purpose. And today, there are lots of different species of bees, and, as I mentioned. And these bees are flying around, collecting different food rewards, moving pollen around all around the landscape. And so this is really, um, I think, one of the most remarkable uh, mutualistic relationships that's ever evolved uh, in the history of life on Earth. Um, and we humans have started to harness these services for our own good. So we rely uh, more heavily than we know on wild pollinators that are living freely to pollinate our food crops. So they play an important role. But we've also actually started to manage uh, a few different species of bee uh, for their pollination services. So here's a picture um, from a bit north of here around Bakersfield. So this is an, an almond bloom that's going on. And these are honey beehives that have been placed in front of the almond bloom. These honeybees are going to fly around. They're going to cross-pollinate these almond plants. And because of that, um, this uh, almond producer will end up with a better crop than he would have if he hadn't put honeybees there. And so this is a perfect example of humans in agricultural development um, harnessing bees and using that pollination service that they provide. To give you a little bit of the scale of this industry, and this is just for honeybees. Again, there are, are other bees, including bumblebees, that we uh, use and manage for pollination. But um, this is an image of the movement of honeybee colonies around the United States. So this is a giant industry. Um, nowhere else in the world does this on the scale that we do. Uh, an individual honeybee colony can make its way all the way around uh, our country following different bloom periods. And so um, this is a huge, um, huge uh, system that involves harnessing bee-mediated pollination. Uh, and it, is, it plays a giant role in our agricultural economy here in the US and in, in other parts of the world as well. Uh, in terms of human health, there are serious implications, too, in, in regard to the, the foods that are pollinated by bees. So if you took the top 100 foods that humans rely on worldwide, um, 70 of those top 100 foods are uh, cross-pollinated by bees or other insects. And so that's a huge um, proportion of, of our top food crops. Uh, but not only that, the, the food crops that bees tend to pollinate uh, and other pollinators tend to pollinate are our fruit, vegetable, and nut crops um, that add the really the diversity in, in terms of um, taste and appearance, but also the nutritional diversity to our diet. So um, rather than uh, we rely heavily on things like wheat and corn and soy, uh, which are not bee pollinated. Uh, but if you look at the things that bees po do pollinate, um, you'll see that we're getting a lot of important nutrients from these foods. And in fact, um, it's estimated that 90% of vitamin A in the human diet comes from bee-pollinated foods. Also, most of our lycopene, so we get most of our lycopene from tomatoes, which are bumblebee-pollinated. And so um, it's no stretch of the imagination that if we didn't have bees and they weren't providing these services and we couldn't produce these crops, um, that there would actually be, be devastating consequences on human health um, and happiness. So. Um, bees are providing these services um, that are so intricately linked to human health. Uh, so again, I, I mentioned that I would focus heavily on bees because they're the group I work with. And they, they are, um, in terms of sort of number of pollination events, they are the most important pollinators. But there are other important pollinator groups as well. For example, butterflies um, also play an important role in a lot of natural ecosystems. Uh, moths, some folks don't know that moths are actually really important pollinators too. So especially uh, for night blooming plants um, or in more arid areas like here in Southern California, moths are very important pollinators of some, some flowering plants. Beetles are another often uh, under-recognized group uh, that pollinate some plants. 
So rather than um, a system like in bees or butterflies where these insects are moving around and collecting food resources sort of very efficiently, uh, beetles tend to uh, get on a flower and sort of move around and trundle around. And, but doing that, they actually end up mov moving around quite a bit of pollen. And so collectively, um, put together, beetles do, some beetles do play an important role in plant pollination as well. Um, there are also vertebrates that are important pollinators, in particular um, bats, like this little guy that, whose face is completely covered in pollen. So just like the moths, um, bats are also important pollinators in um, uh, more arid desert ecosystems and also of night blooming plants. So uh, bats are another important group. And then of course the cute little hummingbirds, they're also important pollinators. And so there are insect pollinators and there are vertebrate pollinators. Uh, collectively, these groups that I've just shown you uh, perform the overwhelming majority of all pollination services, but there are other animals that I haven't highlighted that also play a role. So those are the pollinators. And now in the middle part of my talk, I'm going to um, tell you why pollinators are particularly sensitive to, to global change. So the first thing to tell you on this topic is that not all pollinator populations appear to be declining. And in fact, some pollinator populations are doing just fine, and they're even um, increasing in size. So um, this is a picture from a recent um, paper that was published in PNAS showing the um, the theoretical uh, abundance of bees mapped across the United States. So they use data on habitat to infer um, what er in what areas of the U.S. bees might be particularly abundant. And the thing I want you to take away from this graph is that there are certain areas of the U.S. that at least um, theoretically are very supportive of wild bee populations. And so there are, spatially speaking, parts of the U.S. that maybe are supporting pollinators really well. And then I can also tell you that there are um, some very good records of some pollinator populations that don't show any evidence of decline. So all that being said, though, there is also um, abundant evidence that um, it, other pollinator populations are not doing so well. So this is a graph from a study that came out a few years ago. These are data from the UK where there tend to be really good records about insects, including um, pollinators. This graph shows the cumulative loss of some, a subset of pollinator species in Britain from 1850 up to 1990, but I think you don't really have to use your imagination to project how this, what probably is going on in this graph today. So there's been a pretty steady increase in the cumulative loss of species in the UK, um, and we are seeing similar losses here in the US including we've lost, um, completely lost a few species, uh, including one bumblebee here in California, we think. And so um, there have been some populations undergoing precipitous declines and some extinction events. So um, for a long time when we realized that poll some pollinator populations were declining, um, researchers really and, and the public really wanted to find a single um, strong explanation for why bees are declining. So a smoking gun that maybe if we could figure out what this one thing is, we could fix that one problem and we would see the rebound of pollinator populations. One of the most um, creative of these explanations was the idea, um, how many of you heard the idea that cell phones were causing bee declines? Just raise your hand if you heard that. Oh, I'm surprised it's not more people. Um, that was a pretty popular one. Um, today, there's no evidence uh, uh, for that, but it was a kind of creative hypothesis. Um, but the answer, in some ways, it's much more complicated, and I'll talk about what I mean by complicated. But um, in other ways, I think it's really not so surprising. Um, and we don't need a sort of a crazy, zany explanation for the decline of pollinators. So you know, we are changing our landscape in incredible ways. Um, for example, here's the New York City skyline. We are changing a lot of areas and making them more urban. Uh, I look at this and I think that a little bee trying to find a nesting site would not be very successful in a situation like this. So, um, you know, to me, I see this and I see that a lot of areas on our planet are turning into something like this. And I think, well, you know, no kidding that we're, some pollinator populations are having trouble. Here's an image of the U.S. Um, from space at night. This is a sort of a, an image of light pollution. So some of these um, night foraging and pollinating animals that I talked about, you could imagine in a scenario like this how they might have trouble navigating um, under light conditions. And there's been a recent study, it just came out this week, about moths showing just that. So we're, we're changing the world in ways that you can even see from space. Uh, we're also adding a lot of things to our environment or moving them around into places where they shouldn't be. So um, 
we know that some things are really, uh, for example, heavy metals are very toxic to bees. There are other pollutants that we think, such as air pollution, that are uh, impacting their ability to navigate. So this idea of us creating uh, waste in different forms and putting it in places where it shouldn't be, we know that this is impacting pollinator populations uh, as well. And then one of the most um, important um, driving factors in the decline of wild bee populations is, the, is agricultural intensification in different forms. Now, agriculture done right can actually be great for bees. So there are certain food crops that bloom, and they can be a wonderful food resource um, for bees. But in general, in many places that have a monocultural system where they're growing one or just a few things, uh, especially those when those things don't provide any food resources for pollinators, um, under those scenarios, we're removing a lot of food uh, for pollinators. And so um, there's been a huge movement now to try to incorporate pollinator conservation into agricultural schemes. And some of those efforts are starting to pay off. But very simply, um, generally speaking, agriculture, especially monoculture, often is not helpful for wild pollinator populations. We are also spraying some things um, or adding other things, pesticides to our environment that we know are negatively impacting bee populations. And I'm going to talk a little bit at the end of the talk about this specific topic and my own personal thoughts about it. But there are different, the, the message here is that there are different um, aspects of agriculture that are harming bees differently, whether it's the removing of food resources, the spraying of certain pesticides, et cetera. Um, agriculture, the way it's often done, can often be harmful for pollinators. Uh, so the question I get asked more than any other question, um, you know, if I'm riding on the bus and I tell someone that I work on bees, or if someone sees me out catching insects with a net and they ask me what I work on, I can, I can never lie, I always have to say bees. And then I always get asked the question, what's going on with the bees? So this is a question that I'm thrilled that people are um, thinking about that and they want to know the answer. But the answer to that question, and not to be flippant, but the answer is that it's incredibly complicated. So this graph is really focused on um, honeybees, but there are um, many components of this graph that you could apply to other bees and other pollinators. And so there are these interrelated factors that we know are hurting bees. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenge to try to address some of these things, to figure out which ones are the most important to address. Um, and to, um, to try to, to tackle this, it's going to be a complicated task. And so I think that's the take home message mainly from this graph is that there are lots of things that we um, need to do differently and that we can do differently to help support um, pollinator populations. So now the, the meat of the talk is really going to be more about how you can help pollinators as an individual. So, um, so far there's been a bit of gloom and doom in my talk, but at this point I'm going to make things a little bit more um, hopeful, and I think that there's reason to be, and so I'm going to focus mostly on that. Um, so, and I want to use the analogy of canaries in a coal mine. So, um, back in the day, until the end of the 20th century, miners would uh, take canaries down into coal mines with them. And they would use these birds as an indicator that maybe uh, the, they were entering a space in, in the mines where there were dangerous gases. And the birds were more sensitive to the gases, and so the miners could see if, if, uh, if a canary died in its cage, that was a sign that maybe they should change course um, or not, um, not, not continue down the path that they were continuing down. And I think that this um, analogy is suitable for pollinators. I think that, as I've told you, there are reasons why the ways we're changing our environment makes them particularly susceptible. Um, but I think we can all also use them as an indicator that maybe we are headed down some paths ecologically that it would be better if we stopped for a moment, thought about it, and maybe changed direction. So I think that this is a really good and suitable analogy um, for pollinators. Uh, and luckily, there are lots of great things happening f in regard to pollinator conservation. So there's a lot of interest, a lot of activity. You guys are all here tonight. Um, so there's a lot of hope. And this is something I've seen happen just over the course of my career in bee research, which started in 2006. So this is something that um, when I first started, um, there was some minor, low-level interest in bees, but things have really blown up since then. And it's very heartening to see people care so much about this. And I think people are really recognizing how important they are. So it's been a cause that's been taken up by a lot of different groups. Um, this interest in understanding and recognition of the importance of pollinators has made it all the way up to the highest levels of our federal government, and this is something that's happening in other parts of the world, too. 
So last year, um, our president created a task force to develop a national strategy to try to help pollinators. And this was a huge effort. And we're starting to see some of the, um, the effects of this effort now. So um, you know, for at all levels of sort of civic awareness, we're seeing the importance and uh, uh, the recognition of the importance of pollinators. And these, this recognition is actually starting to turn into some action, um, which is a very exciting thing to see. So I'm going to give you five things that you can do um, to help support the effort to conserve pollinators. And uh, not surprisingly, because I'm a, a professor, the first thing I think is that we need to study them more and we need to learn more about them. Um, we need to know more about the biology of pollinators and specifically the things that they need to sustain healthy populations. And there are a lot of gaps in our understanding of this right now. Um, so this is definitely a major area um, of research that's going on worldwide. Here at UCR, we actually have a really strong cohort of pollinator biologists, and we are in the process right now of hiring um, three more. So uh, we're doing interviews right now, and at the end of this um, interview process, we will have one of the largest uh, contingents of pollinator um, researchers uh, anywhere in the world. So it's going to be uh, an incredible group. Uh, this is all happening right here in Riverside, and so um, I think I can speak collectively for the group. Um, present and future members that we are really excited about getting out in the community and starting to uh, change the way that we manage and conserve pollinators in Southern California. So this is going to be a huge effort going on starting now. Um, but just to introduce you to a few of our uh, sort of our crew members, um, on the top left is uh, Aaron uh, Wilson Rankin. So Dr. Wilson Rankin is a global expert on invasion biology. She did some of the pioneering work on in invasive yellow jackets in Hawaii, but now she's starting to study how um, invasion fronts are impacting uh, California. So one of the, the things that she's working on pretty heavily now is how invasive species impact pollinator communities. So she's thinking at this sort of very high ecosystem level. Um, in the top middle is Dr. Quinn McFrederick, and Dr. McFrederick studies uh, bee-associated microbes. So just like we humans, we now know, have microbes in our guts, and these microbes help us do things like digest food and otherwise stay healthy. Um, bees have gut microbes too. Some of them are beneficial, some of them are harmful. And Dr. McFrederick is really doing some of the leading research um, on this topic, and it's an incredibly um, exciting and very new area of research. So on the top right, there's Doug Yaniga. Dr. Um, Yaniga works in the Entomology Museum. Um, Dr. Yaniga studied with um, the late Charles Michener, who is one of the greatest bee biologists that ever lived. Doug's a specialist in native bees, um, and he works in our museum and is a wonderful asset to the group. And then there's me, and my work focuses um, mostly on bumblebee nutrition, so how food resources impact bumblebees uh, um, in terms of their behavior, their physiology, their populations, really focusing in on this one um, really important group. So this is a, a very exciting thing that's happening right here um, at UCR that I wanted you guys to know about because it's so new you might not know yet. Um, there are also, um, in regard to learning more about pollinators, there are lots and lots of really good books. So these are six of my favorite um, books about pollinators. Within this group, there are great natural history um, there's a great natural history book, books about bumblebees specifically in my group. There's a great book about all native bees in the U.S. and how to plant bee-friendly gardens. So um, if you're interested in these titles, uh, the last slide of my talk, I'm going to put this slide up again so you can write them down if you want to. But, you know, there are so many good resources out there now to learn about pollinators, and these are just a few of them. Uh, the second thing I would say if you want to try to help conserve pollinators is to teach children about them. So in my experience, um, kids get really excited about bees and other pollinators. Um, if nothing else, it's a good excuse to go outside and run around. This is sort of what my lab group looks like on a good day when we get to go outside, <laughs> uh, although usually we're in the lab. Um, but kids get really enthusiastic about, about bees and other pollinators. Of course, they love to run around outside. Um, and I've found, too, that um, they get really interested in learning about the biology of bees, too. So. Um, any outreach I've done where kids have been there, um, they just take to the topic. Uh, so we're going to have our insect fair in a few weeks um, here in Riverside downtown. So that's a great um, opportunity to bring kids and to start teaching them more about not only pollinators, uh, insect pollinators, but other insects as well. And I've found, too, that kids tend to be really good um, communicators of information about pollinators. And so 
if we work with this sort of younger generation uh, and teach them about pollinators, they tend to spread that information on to their parents and other folks. And so this is a main channel um, for conservation in general, is to target kids. Um, and I think for pollinators uh, conservation, they're a really good target group. So my third recommendation for helping um, promote pollinator conservation is to just leave some spaces be. And by that I mean spaces in your yard or any area that you might manage. Um, when I was growing up in North Carolina as a child, I might have seen a yard like this and thought that this looked pretty awesome. So it was very neat and uniform, um, very organized, nice straight lines. Um, this is something that I would have thought looked like a good yard. But now that I know a little bit more about bees and other um, animals and what they need, instead I would see something like this, even in someone's front yard, and think that this looked amazing. So there are, um, it takes in some ways a, a perspective shift to think, to go from thinking something really manicured and orderly looks nice to thinking something a little bit more chaotic uh, is, is actually more uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, but I will guarantee you that if you read more about pollinators, uh, you will experience that similar shift in thinking. Um, and with the added perk that it's often a lot easier um, than having to mow your yard uh, repeatedly. So there are some benefits for you as well to having this. So, um, so again, it's a mental shift, um, but it's one that actually really needs to happen because collectively around the US, um, our, our yards are, th are the area that we own and manage take up a lot of space and if we take those spaces and instead of make them these sort of perfectly um, manicured little areas if we instead um, uh, provide food and nesting resources for pollinators we can collectively have a huge um, impact uh, so that's something that i would strongly recommend so that's the idea of leaving things be and not really managing them but of course you can also actively promote um, bee friendly plants as well in your yard or any spaces that you happen to manage um, there are a lot of great guides online that can tell you about what you, what you should plant. Um, here in California, there are lots of great um, native drought-resistant bee-friendly plants that you can fill your yard with, and they look beautiful. Um, this is one website that has great regional guides for doing that, for figuring out what to plant here. Um, so the Xerces Society is a nonprofit that is focused on invertebrate conservation. So not just pollinators, all invertebrates, but they have a really nice um, pollinator um, unit. And so they have, uh, there are a wealth of information about pollinators in general, and then they have these great guides about what to plant um, to keep bees happy and bring them into your yard. Uh, the last thing I would say is that we need to stop the overuse or misuse of pesticides. And this tends to be a slightly um, controversial topic, and that's because um, for some pesticides, the evidence that they're harming bees is not solid, but there are some groups of pesticides that we know are harming bees. And so the point I'm going to make here is specifically the idea of more informed, um, practical uses of pesticides um, rather than the rampant uh, misuse. Um, now, I'm a realist. I know that we have a lot of people on our planet. So we've already passed the 7 billion mark, and we are creeping on up to 8, and we will keep going past it. And this is something that um, is, is projected, and um, there's no sign that it's going to slow down. So this is something that we have to deal with. Um, and all these people need food. So one of the things that's going to have to go along with this human population increase is that we are going to have to make more food. This is a fact of life. Um, but there are ways that we can do this um, more responsibly uh, that help support uh, bee populations and other pollinator populations. Um, and one of those ways is to be careful about which pesticides we use, um, when we use them, how much we use them. We need to be a bit more critical, in my opinion, about the use of certain classes of pesticides. And so. Um, Pesticides are an, an inevitable um, part of increased human food production, but they can be done, uh, they can be used more uh, cleverly and more sparingly um, to better support pollinator populations. Uh, there's also, there are many examples of the use uh, of pesticides that are clearly, it's clearly unnecessary. So a few years ago, um, there were some linden trees in front of a Target store in Oregon. And the trees were infested with um, a pest. I actually can't remember what the pest was. But um, these trees were sprayed with neonicotinoids. This is one class of pesticides that we know negatively harm bees. 
They harm different types of bees differently, um, but we know in general they tend to harm wild bee populations. Um, anyway, these trees were sprayed um, with neonics, um, this class of pesticides, and what happened was um, right underneath the trees, uh, millions of uh, dead bumblebees started accumulating. Um, and the customers coming into the Target store, um, uh, not surprisingly, were shocked at all of these uh, dead bees. And it ended up being a huge um, um, kerfuffle. And uh, Target got in a lot of trouble for using these pesticides on these ornamental plants. And so in my opinion, I, I would argue that some ornamental trees in front of a Target store, um, spraying them and keeping them going uh, was not worth the death of all these bees. And it's not really just about these two trees, obviously. It's about how this is something that's going on uh, all over the world. These pesticides can be bought um, at, at Home Depot and sprayed wh whenever you want. And so we need to improve our education of these classes of pesticides and um, learn a little bit more about uh, how they're harming some of our beneficial insects. And um, in general, I uh, ascribe to the philosophy um, like uh, Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, this idea, and I'm paraphrasing here, that in general, the first thing we need to do is by default try to be less harmful. And so I think that there are cases where uh, we have to weigh the benefit of using pesticides against the costs. And to do that, obviously, we need to know a bit more about what those costs are. But I think it's, it's generally a smart practice to be a bit more considerate about the things that we're putting out in the environment and how they're impacting um, the organisms, especially those ones that we depend on um, for our food security. To me, that makes sense. And I think it's a good general uh, principle. So I want to return back to this idea um, of canaries in a coal mine and, and uh, make things a bit more um, sort of optimistic. You know, miners uh, back in the day when they would use these canaries, they were using them as a signal, um, as I mentioned, to understand whether they needed to change their behavior and change course. And I think that one thing pollinators and their declines are telling us is that we might be in a situation like that. So we're starting to get some signals um, that are becoming more difficult to ignore, that there are things happening in our world that are going to have um, enormous ramifications for our way of life and the health of our planet. And so pollinators are just one group, even though they are a super important group, as I've told you. Um, they are one group, but I think that they speak to some bigger processes that are going on uh, around the world. And so. I think that they are, uh, we can use them as a signal that we need to start making uh, some changes in the way we do things. And uh, hopefully I've given you a few solutions for things that you can do um, tonight in the talk. And uh, I would also argue, coming back to this urban cityscape, that uh, I think any species that's capable of creating something like this, if they put their attention towards things like um, conservation uh, and environmental sustainability, that we are actually capable uh, of incredible things. And I think that it's, uh, I'm hopeful, I'm very hopeful that we can put some of our attention and efforts towards um, pollinator conservation and other environmental activities, um, or sustainable sustainability activities. I think that if we do that, that there's a lot of room for progress. And I think that there are a lot of ways that we can do things differently. Uh, so not that long ago in human history, a few thousand years ago, the invention of a wheel was a pretty big deal, uh, and it really changed things. But now, not, not that long later, we have um, apparently cars that drive themselves. I haven't seen these yet, but I know that they exist. Um, so we've, met, we've made incredible progress. We've shown that we're capable of all kinds of technological advances. I think now it's time to turn that eye a bit towards um, protecting some of the things that we have here that we really um, can't afford to lose. And I think pollinators are a perfect uh, example of that. And I'll end with this picture, um, a really sort of hopeful idea that I think that um, there are some positive changes going on here in the US and around the world. There are these pollinator um, conservation initiatives that I mentioned. These are going on again uh, at the national scale. Um, there are a lot of positive things happening. And so uh, again, the five things I think that you need to do, in my opinion, are to start learning more about pollinators and how you can conserve them. I think uh, tonight my talk hopefully gave you some things about that, uh, that you can do about that. Teaching kids about them and doing, um, teaching your own children, um, about how they can better conserve uh, pollinators. Uh, spreading that message is important. Leaving some natural areas be. So instead of um, mowing and um, 
turning everything into a perfectly managed uh, landscape, I think that instead we can leave some natural areas so that they can better support pollinator populations. Um, actively um, planting bee-friendly uh, bee plants uh, is another great thing that you can do. And so um, I'll go ahead and close on that, and I'll put up my last slide um, of some of the books that I mentioned earlier. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So thanks very much, uh, Dr. Woodard. So we will now have uh, questions from the audience. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question, and one of the science ambassadors will hand you a microphone. Please state your question. Since the lecture has been uh, video recorded, and in order for everyone to hear your question, Dr. Woodard will repeat the question um, and then answer it. So please uh, raise your hand and wait for one of our ambassadors. Good evening, thank you. Um, the uh, uh, question I have has to do with the fear of bees. Um, and uh, this is widespread. I mean, people are, are afraid of being stung by bees. Uh, is there anything that you can do to um, give us some words of wisdom on what we can do to, to lessen that fear? I've never had any problems, but one time in my whole, my whole life where I've been stung by a bee and it was not a problem, but it's serious for some people. Mm -hmm. I'm a really good person to answer this question, which was, what about the fear of bees? You, you know, this is something that's um, actually pretty widespread, and it potentially is a problem towards trying to promote um, bee conservation. And I'm a great person to answer that question because I am definitely allergic to honeybees. <laughs> so this is something that I developed during graduate school. I got stung so many times, and this is something that actually happens to a lot of honeybee researchers. So I developed um, this terrible allergy, um, but even I, in spite of this uh, deathly allergy, um, I carry EpiPens with me and I still work with bees. And so I think that um, it is a thing, there is a cultural um, uh, fear of bees that you see in, in some folks, and it, there is some rationale to it when folks are allergic. But I think the awareness of how important bees are is starting to overwhelm that, and I, I'm seeing some shifts. Um, I've noticed when I first started working with bees and I would tell people that I worked with them, I think it was about a 50-50 response. I would get half the people would say, oh, that's great, bees are so important, we need to help them, and then the other half would say, oh, man, I'm so scared of bees. I'd say now maybe it's down to maybe 10% give, the, give me the fear response. So even in my short time I've been working on bees, I've, I think I've experienced a cultural shift. But you're right, it is a thing that, that um, it is a factor in public perception of, of bees and other pollinators. That's a great question. Yeah, it does. So the, the question was, um, what if you don't have a lot of space to work with? Can you still do some things to um, help promote pollinators? And absolutely. In fact, there are um, entire books about that now. So there are books about container gardens, and from that, from those, you can pick some of the bee-friendly plants from among those. And if you put them out, um, uh, I've seen, I've ha lived in places where I didn't have a lot of space, and you will still see bees coming. So there's a huge effort now in urban areas in general to try to integrate um, spaces for pollinators into our cityscapes. And so, yeah, if you if you plant flowers uh, in, in whatever container or form, the bees will come in, I, I guarantee you. <laughs> 
So the question is, um, if we're spraying pesticides to control West Nile, uh, how might that be impacting bees? So to the best of my knowledge, the components of those pesticides are not harming bees. So there is no evidence. So one of the, m the most harmful classes are these neonicotinoids. And they are um, most commonly used on ornamentals. And these are bought, it can be bought in little spray bottles at your Home Depot. And it's actually more the personal use of those um, that's having a, having a fairly significant impact on bees. So, no. So the question is, are, are neonicotinoids labeled? There's been a, a big um, movement um, in uh, the sort of home goods stores to start labeling um, neonic treated plants. There was a, a big scandal not too long ago um, uh, where um, an independent company tested plants that uh, had not been treated with neonicotinoids as adult plants, but the seeds had actually been treated, and there were residues of neonics on these plants that were being sold. I believe it was at Home Depot, so, and that caused a huge um, sort of scandal. And so there is an awareness that these plants that are bought typically at these more sort of home and garden stores like that, um, that they may be um, treated with neonics, and so there has been an effort to start labeling them. Here in California, I actually haven't visited any, any of these stores, so I don't know if that effort has extended here. Um, but it is something that people are thinking about and that they're aware of. Um, is there any research or any plans that there is a non bee population? It, uh, it, the question was, is there any, are there any data showing that air pollution is harming bee populations? There are some very good studies showing that it impacts chemoreception. So, um, and that that ultimately has impacts on navigation. So bees, um, and all this work, to the best of my knowledge, was done in honeybees. So honeybees have really incredibly sophisticated navigational abilities. They go out and forage um, really far away from the colony. They come back and they dance, uh, a dance language, to communicate to their sisters in the hive where food resources is, uh, are. It's this really sophisticated, really neat system. And um, there have been a few studies now that have shown at least the navigation component of that system is impacted by air pollutants. And it, the evidence for that is solid. Is there something I can do to help the honeybees not drown in my swimming pool? Hmm. Uh, question was, is there a way to prevent honeybees from drowning in swimming pools? Mm. So honeybees are pretty unique among bees in that they go to water sources and they, they forage on them and they bring it back to the hive. And then they regurgitate the water and they fan their wings and they use it to cool off the colony. Um, this is really neat behavior that they've evolved. But because of that, they need to go to water sources. So I can't think of a great way, but that's a great invention. If there are any inventors here, you could come up with something like that, a bee screen. But they're driven to do that because it, the water helps them. It serves an important function. So. Yeah, um, I was wondering, is there any evidence that glyphosate will be another big harm in the bee population? We, we keep hearing requests about monocytoplasm, et cetera. Is there anything uh, to that in terms of bees? Um, what about glyphosate? Is there solid evidence that it's harming bees? There are some studies that I think are compelling, but the majority of the studies, as you mentioned, have more to do with um, uh, herbivores and including larval stages of butterflies. So, hi. Hi. That's a very, very good question. So um, uh, 
I didn't talk a lot about this tonight, but honeybees and this huge system of moving honeybees around, and there are a lot of um, sort of backyard beekeepers. Um, honeybees aren't native to the U.S. They were brought here, um, and they keep being brought here sort of repeatedly. And they are really important, especially in agricultural ecosystems. Um, however, all these other uh, native bees uh, that are coming to your garden that you uh, hopefully want to keep coming there, there is some evidence that if you have a honeybee hive nearby that there is some competition with native bees and honeybees are in many cases superior competitors. They're just quick, there are a lot of them. So, um, so it's a personal decision whether or not you want to keep honeybees. It's, it's pretty fun, or at least I thought that until I became so allergic. Um, so <laughs> it is a fun hobby, and they are really fascinating. But um, there is an interplay or a trade-off between them and the, the native bee species, definitely. Uh, so in an urban garden uh, in Riverside, what um, types and numbers of bees might you see? I'm actually not a great person to answer that question because I just got here. <laughs> so I'm still learning about our native bee communities. I have an undergraduate student who's going to start um, surveying bees in the botanic gardens on campus. And so um, if you ask me that question again, at the end of the season, I might have a better answer. But they're pretty abundant um, and um, fairly diverse. Uh, sadly, though, we do not get a lot of uh, bumblebees here. Apparently, we used to, but we don't anymore. So I find that pretty tragic. But there are lots of other um, bees around. So follow up with me again, and I'll have a list for you. Um, so if someone's observed swarming bees in their home garden, is there a way to anticipate whether these bees might be dangerous? So I'll start with one thing. Um, honeybees actually, when they're swarming, they're at their most docile. So it's a thing that they do when they they reach a certain critical mass in the colony and they swarm and they'll leave the colony and they'll usually hang out outside or, or outside of the hive uh, on a hanging on a tree branch or on a fence. Is that the kind of thing that you're describing that you've seen, or is it something? Are they more flying around? Okay, yeah, you might have been in a, a key flight path between food resources or something like that. I'm just speculating, but. Um, uh, the solitary bees, uh, the native so non-honey bees, they tend to be extremely docile. So um, honey bees are more likely to sting you than other bees. A lot of these other native bees, you can actually stand right in front of them. They can fly right into you and they don't sting you. Um, so um, not only do they are they less likely to sting you, but their sting hurts a lot less. So that's maybe m less meaningful, but they are less like to, likely to sting you. So um, I would say um, there's no way to tell if there is some event going on where they're becoming more aggressive, but it's incredibly unlikely that they are. So that's something to consider. Yeah, so um, catch one and <laughs> bring it. If you have it, show me a picture and I'll tell you. It might be, I'll see how well I can do with the photo ID. It's hard sometimes, but I'll try, and I'll let you know. Yeah. Okay, well, please join us in thanking Dr. Thank you.